Ladies and gentlemen, without any further introduction, I would like to have you give a large warm welcome to Senator Dick Durbin. I thank you. I thank you to Julian Koulis, to Paul Bendruski, and Alex Strelchek, and all of you for coming here today. Uh, we are expecting momentarily a call from the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, and as soon as he calls, uh, I will stop talking immediately so that uh, he can uh, tell us the latest report on what is happening, and then perhaps we can ask a few questions of him uh, about, I'm sure there are many questions uh, that uh, are in this audience today. I just left a meeting of Lithuanian Americans celebrating the independence of Lithuania. It was an important meeting for me. It was an important meeting for me because my mother was born in Lithuania. I am a first generation American. I am the son of an immigrant and I am proud to serve in the United States Senate. That is my story. That is my family's story. That is America's story. Immigrants who've come from all over the world to this great nation and made it a better place. We are proud to be here. We are proud to be Americans. We pledge allegiance to the flag, but we have deep in our hearts a love for that country that was the country of our parents and our grandparents. And that is why we gathered today, because of your concern and my shared concern about the future of Ukraine. We know that there are many changes taking place there. We also know that there are threats to the future of Ukraine. And I'm hoping as soon as the ambassador calls, he can give us information, the most current information about what is happening. There is a new government in Ukraine. Yesterday, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, called me. We had a conversation about Ukraine. And I'm hoping that he will be able to travel there this week. We want Americans and European leaders to come to Kyiv. We want them to meet with the new government. We want to make it clear that we are going to work with them to find a way to resolve some serious issues. And there are very serious issues. Many of you know, through your family and friends, that the economy of Ukraine has problems, serious, challenging problems. But they are problems that can be solved. The International Monetary Fund is preparing a plan to help keep, uh, Ukraine recover from this current economic crisis. Friday, the Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, Secretary of the Treasury Jack Lew called me on Friday and he talked in the most general terms about what we are going to do in the United States working with the International Monetary Fund to help the Ukrainian economy recover. Now there will be sacrifices and reforms that must be part of this. Some of them will be difficult, some will be unpopular, but our hope is at the end of the day we will have a stable economy in Ukraine. As well, we want to make certain that it evolves into a, uh, an election situation where there is a clear, peaceful transfer of power. Julian mentioned that I had helped over the years with Yulia Tymoshenko. I had never met the woman, but I thought it was unfair that she was in prison. And I appealed to Yanukovych and all their leaders to release her. I was not alone. The European Union and others joined in the same request. I don't come here today promoting her. I don't know what her future will be, if any. I just thought it was an injustice that she was in prison for over two and a half years. Now it is up to the people of Ukraine to make a decision about their leader, whoever that might be. They have an interim leader chosen by parliament, and they are moving forward. Now let's speak, while we're still waiting for the call to come in, let's speak for a moment about Crimea. I had to go back to my history book and start reading about Crimea, and many of you know it far better than I do, that this part of the world, the autonomous republic of Crimea, has been the scene of a lot of international conflict and competition over the last several centuries and even before. The Crimean War of 160 years ago, the decision that Crimea would become part of Ukraine under Soviet times, the decision that Ukraine would reach an agreement with Russia, a basing agreement, for them to place some military in Crimea. The fact that many of the Crimean Tatars 
were deported from Crimea by Stalin, sent to some different place in the world, and then brought back in small numbers after imprisonment and denial. All of these things suggest that this is an area in some turmoil, but it does not justify sending in Russian troops. That to me is unacceptable. <laughs> President Obama was in a direct conversation with Vladimir Putin for 90 minutes, an hour and a half, talking about Ukraine. And I asked John Kerry, how was that conversation? He said it was ominous, it was worrisome. There were no commitments made by Putin. Uh, he was expressing the fact that he needed to send in troops to protect those living in Crimea of Russian ancestry and Russian language and certain religious groups. And what the president made clear to Putin was this was unacceptable. It was unacceptable not just to the United States but unacceptable to the world government. What we need to do is to work with the United Nations, although I am very realistic, the Russians are going to veto any effort by the Security Council to intervene, we know this, but we need to bring the world together in opposition to Russian aggression. And that has to be an effort led by the United States of America. I am hoping that Mr. Putin will come to his senses, but this man learned his diplomacy and finesse as head of the Soviet KGB. So I do not have great hopes that he is a man, some have called him a spiritual man, I have not said that myself. I view him much differently, of course, with my Lithuanian blood uh, in terms of the relationship between my mother's homeland and the Soviet Union. I also understand that he spent $50 billion in Sochi to present an image of Russia to the world. My belief is he has ruined the image of Sochi on the streets of Sebastopol. And we have to make it clear. And we have to make it clear that we will judge Russia and every other nation in terms of what they do, not what they look like or what they say. And as far as Ukraine and its future is concerned, that is critically important. Now, I don't want to keep going. Uh, John, have we heard yet from the ambassador? One minute. Okay, so I, I can always do one minute. <laughs> but I want to, let me just personally thank you. I know that you came after church, and many of you made special trips to be here. Uh, but it's very important. It is important to people in Ukraine to know that there are people all around the world who are watching this and really care. Many of you, many of you still have family there. You certainly have ties there and blood there and memories of uh, your connection with Ukraine. That poor country has been through so much. But in 1994, Ukraine made a promise to the world. Ukraine said, we will give up our nuclear weapons in the agreement, the Budapest Agreement, if we can be protected in terms of our sovereignty and national identity. That was accepted by the world, accepted by Russia. That they would sacrifice their nuclear weapons, give them up in the name of peace, stability, and protection from the world from that point forward. The invasion of Ukraine by any country, especially one that was a signatory to this Budapest Agreement, directly violates the terms of that agreement. And the Watched, and I'm sure you watched even more closely what was happening in Maidan, I believe. Maidan, is that proper? Yes. Maidan Square. And there was there are a lot of allegations, and, and some may be true, some may not. I have no way of knowing. Of snipers, who sent the snipers, uh, who paid for the snipers. The people died. We know that much. Some say 65, some say many more died as a result of the violence. This is a repetition of what many countries have been through. Even Ukraine was through not that long ago. I think the lesson of Yanukovych is a lesson that is learned over and over again. When you turn the guns on your own people, you cannot last. There is no way that you can continue in power. Now, perhaps Syria has gone on a long time without that being resolved. But in most countries, once you start shooting your own people, 
in the square when they're asking for a, de for a democratic change, you soon lose your legitimacy and lose your power. I think we're ready now.